Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Carrie Jacobs Crevetto, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you so much, John. It's good to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the Bay Area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about a really interesting topic in my mind, soul retrieval at work. Uh, this is in, in my mind, connected to some of the things we've talked about previously on the podcast in relation to mindfulness and self-reflective practices and and being your whole self at work. Uh, but frankly, I'm, I'm not exactly sure where this is going to go. And so I'm really excited to explore this with Carrie today. As we get started, I wanted to share Carrie's bio with everybody. Carrie Jacobs Crevetto is an executive coach and advisor specializing in leadership development. After an advertising career working with Levi's, P&G, and Lexus, and work with startups like Sunrun and ModCloth, she pivoted towards work towards personal growth. Uh, she's certified by UC Berkeley and coach at Stanford. Now, Carrie, anything else you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Well, I think it'll probably become apparent as we talk. Okay, great. Um, well, why don't we start then with just some framing? Um, what in your from your point of view and from your practice, is this soul retrieval work all about? So, well, you started off saying something that caught my energy right away, which is whole self, this, like, this concept of bringing our whole self to work. And I think the first starting point is for us to ask ourselves, how much do we really, truly know ourselves mm -hmm. in today's world? You know, things are moving so quickly. And most of the time we're operating from a pretty decentralized state of self, not a whole self. So even the idea, I think people think of, okay, when I am bringing my whole self, that means I can just sort of do or say or be whatever I want. And that's bringing my whole self, but actually it's quite a different concept, which is first kind of having a depth of understanding mm -hmm. of why we operate the way we do and what prompts us to operate the way we do. That's sort of step one. And then step two is then understanding how we bring that in full into the workplace that we don't feel like we're being unseen or we're not actually being fully expressed at work. Yeah, I really like that. And and like you said, that first step, uh, so important. And I, you know, I think most people think, yeah, this idea of bringing your whole self to work, that sounds great. Uh, I think most people want to feel comfortable right. being who they are at work and not trying to put on a mask and like be this, this other person that uh, everyone expects them to be. I think people kind of intrinsically get the notion, uh, but it's really hard to bring your, bring your whole self to work in an authentic way if you don't really know who your, your whole self is and who, all the different aspects of yourself. And, and frankly, I think it's a lifelong endeavor for us to really tr truly try to uncover that um, because we all have our past histories and some cases past traumas. We all have different dynamics we, we're dealing with in the workplace, different types of relationships. And all of that just muddies the water and makes it complicated. So it, it's not just a, a foregone conclusion that we can just decide one day, I'm going to bring my whole self to work and that it can magically happen because we don't always fully understand what that's all about. Um, and it's true. Like there are things that we can do at work as leaders to create a safe space, to uh, create psychological safety and to promote this idea of, of holistic wellness that includes in my mind, things like bringing your whole self to work. We can promote that. We can try to enshrine that in policy and practice and procedure within the organization. That's great. But if, if people don't first understand who they are and what makes them tick and why they do the things they do, right. and, whatnot it, it's it's not what, what happen, is our right? whole self in the first place yeah. right who who uh, who am i yeah. is the big question in the first place so you asked a little bit about my background and you gave a little snapshot but a little bit more context there is that when i was um 
probably in my mid thirties, I'm in my fifties now. So when I was in my mid thirties, I began a rigorous practice. This was in, you know, the sort of late, late, late 1990s, early 2000s, a very rigorous practice of meditation. And this was sort of way before it was, you know, hip and cool today. Mm -hmm. So going out and doing like a seven day meditation retreat was largely unheard of in the workspace. And that work continued for me up until it was still continues today. But the depth of that work where I took it is I spent three months in silence in the Himalayas, meditating, you know, in silence from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day. I did over 2,500 hours of silent retreat. And much of that was just really coming into contact with who am I, this question of who am I? And why that is so critical and so important as I advanced throughout my career and eventually became a chief marketing officer in several startups and now teach at Stanford, a piece of that was um, that I was fairly out of control. I didn't really know who I was. I was operating as a young leader, you know, in my early 30s, I was promoted very early to vice president. I was operating as a young leader, largely from a space of what I would call sort of a, a discombobulated state of self. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had I had conjured up notions of what that meant from my mind. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very different to conjure up notions of that from a very grounded whole place from internal inside the self, inside of the body and the sort of somatic and neurobiology system, which is what we're doing when we practice it. Right. We're actually going into a different space other than the mind. And so that kind of work, that sort of knowing of oneself to be able to even step into the concept of whole self is very, very different. Um, one thing I'll share with you is, you know, I call it a soul retrieval moment that I had when I was 39. And I was, as you said, I was working in an ad agency. My client was Lexus. For all, if you look from the outside in, you know, I owned a home in Santa Monica, California, six blocks from the beach. I had a great relationship. I had a great job. I had clients that I loved and that loved me back. And I just had one of those moments where I was sitting at work one day and I paused and I can, I can remember where the sun was. I can remember where I was sitting and this thought or feeling or sensation from my physical body, which was like, am I happy? Like, am I really happy? Do I even know what happiness is? And of course, at 39 years old, about to turn 40, right? This is a big moment. And mm -hmm. in an instant, in, in 24 hours, I quit my job, sold my con, I put my condo up on the market that week. I sold 50% of my things and I took off. And that's when I went and traveled and sat in India and did a lot of depth work. And for me, what came back out of that was a different way to hold the question of who am I? And I think that's a, a big piece of what we're talking about here today is how much do we really know ourselves when we come across in, in these moments where we're asked, whatever they are, some people it happens when they're skiing, some people it happens when they're taking care of their child or when they're in a meeting and they suddenly have the, you know, these moments, they spark up and usually we just roll right over them. Right. I were like, oh. but I just stopped and said, what is it that will make me happy? And sort of went on this adventure to figure out who my whole self really was. That's really cool. And you frame it as an adventure. I think many people would find it as terrifying and very scary. Um, maybe it was a little bit of that for you as well. Maybe that's <laughs> yeah. the adventure piece. I don't know. But, you know, and, and we all, I don't know, we talk about midlife crises, for example, and we say midlife, but it can happen at any time. And mm -hmm. a lot of times it happens when people have been going down a path, they find themselves even perhaps they feel a little bit stuck doing something that they used, maybe they used to love it and they just don't anymore for whatever reason. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I'm not going to frame that frame it that way for you, but as you were talking about, it, I'm like, Oh, I I've had some similar experiences. And for me, at least I would say some of that is at least kind of going through this existential midlife kind of situation. Like, am I where I want to be? Um, do I really understand what I want? What, why am I doing what I've been doing? Is it because I really wanted to, because I really liked it? Is it because it's what other people expected of me and what I thought was successful, you know, whatever, like, was it external stuff being imposed on me that I just accepted? Or was it really what I wanted? And I think that's a, a hard question. And, and, and 
you know, life is messy and it's probably a combination of both. Right. Um, but overall you, you, you ultimately gave yourself space to lean into the discomfort and to, um, to, to run with it and to not just push past that feeling that we all tend to have at one point or another. And, and for you, that was, you know, quit your job, sell your stuff, sell your condo, move into a different direction and, and spend some time to get to know yourself better. Um, what would you suggest? I mean, not everyone's in a position where they, maybe they feel like they can do that. What would you right. suggest are some practical things that, that anyone could do to start to really lean into knowing themselves better, doing that self-reflective work, really making sure that they are where they want to be. And for some pe people, that is a complete career, uh, career transition and shift. For other people, maybe it's just trying to mm -hmm. rekindle their love for their profession or for their relationships or, or whatever. I, I can, it can play out in a lot of different ways for different people, but it has to start with this willingness to lean into that discomfort and the willingness to lean into some sort of self-reflective practice so you can really better understand where you're coming from, right? I think when you said something that, that just uh, is the first thing I want to address, which is, yes, midlife crisis. I believe that what used to be a midlife crisis is now happening for people at a very young age. I, mm. you know, there's Generation Z, the younger millennials are asking these hard questions and have come, maybe it was pandemic related. Mm. Maybe it was, maybe it's social media related. Maybe it's just the way we advanced a society. But I can tell you that I've guested on many podcasts and some of them I'm guessing with quite, you know, young hosts mm -hmm. where these hosts are asking me these questions that are, you know, questions I didn't ask myself until I was, you know, almost 40. And these are 25 year olds, 27 year olds. So, I think this concept, first of all, that what used to be midlife crisis has now expanded to become crisis. Hmm. And that crisis is really, what are we doing here? What's it all about? And that question is being asked, not just by people who are turning 40, who kind of sort of found themselves in the position, by, but by younger and younger people who are wondering why did we construct this whole thing the way we constructed it, right? And, and it started with millennials sort of breaking everything and saying, let's reconstruct it. But now this next generation, I think, is saying, wait a minute, why? What, what is the point of all of this? Mm -hmm. You know, my best friend's son, he's 23 years old and he came into the house, you know, he has a full-time job and he came into the house and he said to her, so is this all there is? Like, do I just <laughs> go to work and then I come home and then I like eat dinner and I go to, and she, you know, she looked at him and said, well, yes, yeah, kind of is, right? But to look at 23 year old heart and soul being in the space, in the face and say, yeah, this is pretty much what it's about. Like there's a moment, right, where we're realizing we're not just in midlife crisis, we're in crisis crisis. And out of that crisis crisis, I think people are doing to get to your second point, like, what do I, what can I do? Sure. You can absolutely take some time. Mm -hmm. If you can afford it and go travel, but that's certainly not, um, that's certainly not what you need to do. I think the first step, and, and, and this is no new news, right? This concept of practicing mindfulness and, and meditation, but I, I'm going to share what is new news from my perspective. Many people come to the practice of mindfulness and meditation to quell anxiety, right? Or to um, calm themselves down so that they can feel more centered. That's sort of what I would call, you know, opening the jar. You're just mm -hmm. taking the top off. But there's a whole jar of experience that happens as we deepen that practice. Why is that important for us as business people? Twofold. Number one, we're answering that question more and more of who am I and what makes me happy. So here's what I found out. So I went to India. I went to Africa. I sat in Himalayas. I did all these I mean, deep, 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 meaningful work, right? That to your point, not everyone can do. And I came back and I had, you know, I think I had like at the time $6,000 in my pocket. I was sleeping on a friend's couch. This is after, you know, owning a home, right. sleeping on a friend's couch, trying to figure out what was I going to do with my life? Well, it turns out I went right back into marketing, right? I did, I started doing something slightly different with a little more consciousness around it. And I'm doing solar energy versus like selling a luxury vehicle. Um. But I was still doing marketing. The difference was inside me. 
the difference didn't come from some external way that the world had to reconstruct itself for me. Mm -hmm. The difference was me in and of myself. And the depth work that I did was around just basically digging and digging and digging this question of who am I and what makes me happy. This is the soul retrieval. You could do it at any point in time in your life without changing anything around you, right? Sometimes people will come across, you know, some big insight that says, okay, I need to pivot and do something radically different to be happy. But oftentimes, even when they pivot, this moment will be emerge, right? Of even through that pivot, okay, now I'm doing the thing that I thought was going to make me happy, and I'm still not happy. And this is when I'm hopeful that anyone who hears this podcast anyway, or hears me speak, or who coaches with me, will have that moment where they realize this is an internal game, guys, right? And when you pull up the top of the jar, of meditation you're only you're basically just letting the air out of the time there's a whole world to participate in that not only gets you closer to who you are but makes you a better leader which is even more important right yeah yeah i really like all of that and again like you said it's kind of the first step we we need to make sure that we're doing that work and it can be hard work and it, it it's not something that just happens overnight um correct I like how you you identified, you know, that it, when we say midlife crisis, it's that's a that's a generic phrase that we use, but it can happen to anyone at any time, and uh, and I applaud young people who are really thinking deeply about their priorities and their values and what matters to them. Um, I think you're right that in many cases, for many people, the pandemic was a catalyst to kind of reevaluate. Um, what maybe mm -hmm. they took for granted, uh, what they just assumed was the way it had to be and, and started to push back against the status quo. And I think younger people certainly have been doing that. Um, so whether you're young or you're middle-aged or you're old or whatever, I think we, we all have an opportunity to reinvent ourselves uh, and to recalibrate uh, our values and priorities around, you know, how they connect with what we're actually doing in our lives. And I think that's really healthy work. And so doing that work and being committed to the self-reflective practices, the meditation, the mindfulness, all of that, I think is super important. Now, if we go to that next step and we start to like, if I'm thinking about as a leader within my organization, hopefully first and foremost, I'm modeling this for my people so that they recognize like it's, it's a really good thing for you to go through this process uh, and that I'm going to be there and I'm going to be supportive of you and I'm going to be encouraging of you to do that. And I'm going to model for you how I do it. And hopefully, you know, that gives others permission to do it as well. Um, but also as a leader, hopefully I'm creating, you know, systems and processes and that give permission and flexibility that allow people to do this type of work. So when I think about soul retrieval at work, um, I think about how do I help my people to be more satisfied, more engaged, more passionate and, and finding meaning and purpose in the work that they do. And how do I create an environment where that can happen and be optimized, mm -hmm. right? Any thoughts on how leaders can, can create that kind of an environment proactively? Yeah. I mean, I'll also flip it to you since you use the I word, right? When I think about, so our, it sounds like you've got some familiarity with this type of practice. So what have you noticed for yourself when you're in mindful behavior? Like what happens in your system if you're standing up in front of your team, for example, or you're facilitating a conversation? What's happening for you? I think one thing that's not happening is that I'm, I, I don't, if, if I'm in a more mindful place, I'm being present with the people I'm around and I'm not allowing the busyness, the hecticness of, of the work mm -hmm. get ahead of me. I'm not, I'm not allowing, mm -hmm. I'm not allowing myself to be sucked into like just putting out fires mode all the time, which is what a lot of leaders end up spending a lot of the, their time doing, um, that I'm going to give myself the opportunity and the time to be with and sit with my people and to have important, meaningful conversations, uh, with them. Um, those are some of the types of things that I'm thinking about and trying to do, I, I guess, at least yeah. when I'm trying to create that kind of an environment. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, you said the P word, which is great present, right. Really being present to the, to the scenario, to yourself, allowing people space, 
to breathe, allowing people not thinking forward into like, where do I have to go? Where's the I in this game? Right. Mm -hmm. What is my, what am I trying to get out of this? But really opening it up so that other people can really come forward. Um, I think that also what you described is space, right? That you create space in the room, you're creating space within yourself, which is most important. And I don't know, I always like the story of two leaders, right? You have two leaders, let's say two CEOs. And both CEOs, if you were to sit in a room with them, have they don't enter the conversation a lot. They leave a lot of space for other people, right? Both CEOs are asking curious questions. Both CEOs have a grounded sense about them. One CEO is if you were to, you know, be able to x-ray the CEO's brain, it's just pinging around, right? What's the mm -hmm. next thing? What's my to-do list? Where am I going? And even though the composure can look as if it's there, the inside is like a treacherous storm, right? The other CEO, if you were to x-ray their brain, is actually like one flat line of reception. And that reception is coming in in two ways. It's coming in from the outside, from the team, for example, but it's also coming in from that person's body, an ability to receive what that person is feeling from themselves. This is kind of the first step of what I would call soul retrieval, right? Is this ability to be able to have this inner radio, right? That you're tuning into that is both receiving the outside world, but it's also receiving the self at the same time. And you notice with these kinds of CEOs, right? Again, these two leaders look the same, but there's a difference oftentimes in how that meeting and what it, what acceleration, what in, innovation, what can come out of space and time when a leader is sitting in that space. And it's not easy, Right it's to your point earlier, like this is not easy stuff. It looks easy, sounds easy. Oh, just sit in meditation, be mindful, whatever that means, right? But getting your brain to the point where you can have more of that steady line and where you can have the receiver coming in and the receiver coming up from the body is really powerful. That's the work that I'm doing at Stanford, right? The whole course on just putting MBA students who have been largely acceleratory, they've been, they're type A, they've been rewarded, rewarded for the pain that happens in their brain. And now we sit them down and say, okay, we're going to talk about feelings. <laughs> if you can imagine, right? And most of the time they're searching for feelings from their brain, which is not where feelings come from, right? So this moment when we're putting people back in touch with that inner radio Right. That's the big, that's the big piece here. And I think once we do that, sometimes the happiness level, oftentimes, I would say I've not seen it happen otherwise. Oftentimes the happiness piece comes with that. Like you can stick mm. me now in any situation. You and I didn't talk before this. We had three minutes of saying hello to each other. You can pop me in any situation and I will be happy. So long as I have time to do my practice, right, is to be able to receive you, John, and to be able to sense of like, what is coming up to me? What do I really, really feel and want to say to you right now? Carrie, I note the time. Uh, I need to let you go here in just a minute. Unfortunately, this has been a, just a fun conversation. Like you said, this wasn't scripted. Uh, we, we really just had a general premise that we were starting from. And I think it's been a really nice organic dialogue. And I hope that we've given people at least a few nuggets, a few ideas of where um, you can take uh, your own work around soul retrieval personally, but also how you can um, create space and create an environment at work with your team where you can encourage them and promote this uh, with, with them as well, so that we can all just be a little bit more in tune, so we can all um, tap into to our values and our priorities and better understand ourselves and how that relates back to the work that they do, that we do, that they do so that we can all find more meaning and purpose, more passion, that we can all do better stuff and just create more value yeah. for those around us. And ultimately that's well, what, what I think comes from all of this. And I'll add, because when we do that, we change the world. Yeah. Right. As we're, if we're just hanging around in those, in the constancy of our brain, it's really difficult 
for us to get down into true shift and true change, right? So I really appreciate you allowing space and time to have this kind of conversation. It's a little esoteric, right? Um, and, you know, practicing meditation, practicing mindfulness, getting a great leadership coach who understands how to take a real-time situation, right? Like I'm sitting with my investors and X, Y, Z happens. What do I do, right? And then instead of answering from the brain, we actually put this sort of these receptors online, right? And by virtue of doing that, you bring your whole self to work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Carrie, as we wrap up, I just want to give you a moment to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us any final word that you might have on the topic for today. Yeah, so I'm an executive coach, as you said. I facilitate um, executive meetings. I coach one-on-one. I coach teams. You can find me at super easy, www.carriejacobs.com. Um, I also offer a free one hour complimentary introductory session where we can get to know each other and see if um, there's help to be given. And I would close by saying I do this work because I was pretty unhappy for a long time as a leader. I was pretty stiffed out. I didn't really understand why I was doing what I was doing. And I myself now with that and help other people become happy and become and feel fulfilled not only in themselves families but in what they're really in the impact they're really having on the larger script of, of the planet so thank you for having me john well thank you so much i encourage the audience to reach out get connected find out more about what carrie can do for you and as always i hope everyone can stay healthy and safe they can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day and i hope you all have a great week Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.